So I'm going to start recording. Okay then. Hello everyone to the Qubit community meeting. It's uh, 4th of uh, September, 2024. Um, please everyone, um, if you would be so kind to share your, um, your attendance to the to the document of which I am posting the link right now into the chat. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to uh, announce that we are um, have a couple of uh, possibilities to join the community. You can, first of all, as an organization, if you are using uh, an active user of Kubert, you can add your organization to the adopters markdown. Second of all, we have a Twitter uh, account, which you can follow. Um, then there is the community page, which you can look at um, and see like the relevant information when it comes to like announcements with respect to appointments. Um, and finally, obviously, you can, if you're a regular contributor, you can join as a GitHub project member. So my question now to uh, the community, do we have any new members this week that would like to introduce themselves? OK, so I think that is not the case. Then let's take a quick look at the schedule where we are. So at the moment, we are just um, before the milestone where the CI lands for the new provider, which is 131, uh, becoming voting. Um, I think that actually we did that already. I'm not completely sure. I would need to verify that. I've lost a bit of track, I must admit. But yeah, at the 10th, uh, the CI islands will get voting at the latest. So you will then see that um, if uh, your tests are not failing on the, or uh, not passing on the 131 lane, your uh, PRs will not merge. Um, that's, that will be the effect of that one. Uh, then a week later, on the 17th of uh, September, we will we are planning to do the beta release for the version 1.40. And um, yeah, that's that's the outlook for September. Um, next um, is the upcoming call for papers check-in. So I think um, currently we are, um, beyond uh, the recent conferences that have been published here. So um, there is nothing that I would announce. Maybe if people um, have talks that they want to uh, get announced, uh, please take a look at the events page and uh, probably submit a pull request on that one so that you can get your uh, talks published. Mm. And um, if there is no question to that, I would then um, go on to the agenda notes, um, of which the first point is um, Ahmad Jasser's work on GSOC with respect to Qubit CI rewrite. Amar, I hope you are here. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so uh, do you want to present something? Um, so um, I would, I think you can just uh, start sharing your screen if you want. Let me try. Um, it says that you cannot part share while someone else is. So can you please uh, stop your share so I can try it out? Sure, wait a second. So, okay. Now I've stopped sharing. Okay, let me try. Yes, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it, thanks. Perfect. So uh, first of all, uh, let me quickly tell you a bit about myself. 
Uh, so I am Amar. I have been working on the JSOC project of rewriting Qvert CI into Go over the past three months. And I'm excited to share with the Qvert community about uh, what have has been achieved and what are the benefits that we have accrued from this effort. So first of all, for those that uh, maybe not involved with Qbert CI or don't know Qbert CI because I know that some of you uh, work on other repos. So Qbert CI is the core of what runs to provision a cluster for you, uh, whether in local development or whether uh, in actual CI testing while you are uh, about to merge your pull requests. Qbert CI will provision a cluster uh, containing all the things that Qubert needs to uh, run. And then uh, a, Qubert, uh, a Qubert will be synced or will be deployed to this cluster where the tests will run on it. And this is the usual uh, testing flow for Qubert. So it has uh, several components. Uh, cluster up. Cluster up is a collection of uh, bash scripts that are used to uh, actually up the cluster. Uh, and it what this part is what gets copied over to the other Qbert repos. It what gets copied over to Qbert and uh, um, is what's being called when you run make cluster up. It's actually calling this. So, and it also includes uh, um, the entirety of the logic required to provision kind uh, clusters because you can you can run kind clusters or vm based clusters so if you are trying to run a vm cluster it will call um an engine or like something um called the go cli which is as the name suggests a cli written in go that creates those virtual machines uh, required for the cluster but if it's kind, then it doesn't call the Go CLI. It just provisions a kind cluster using pure bash functions. And it uses a container image, uh, comes pre-built with what's needed to launch the VM. Uh, and this image gets built through cluster provision. Cluster provision is what runs to create uh, uh, this image and install in it the required Kubernetes versions and uh, um, all what's needed to actually make this image able to perform its task. And then there's the Go CLI, which is the actual core component or the actual engine that runs all of this, especially for the VM-based part, creates uh, uh, what's necessary. So what have we changed? Um, first of all, SSH connections were being established because during the up, like the uh, running of a cluster, some commands need to run on the VMs. So how would this SSH, uh, this uh, command take place? There was a script inside of the uh, of each container. Uh, this script is as you see. It's this. It executes a command directly on the uh, VM, the VM IP that maps to this container index. Meaning that in order to execute a command, you would jump first to the container and then jump to the VM where you want to execute your command. And this is actually prone to a very, very large number of issues because um, if the SSH command, for example, doesn't return for any reason, you do stand a chance of getting your job stuck forever, which is uh, an actual problem that we did uh, face in uh, uh, cluster uh, provision. Uh, so, uh, I will show you an example of this. Here, for example, this shutdown command for example, we'll shut down the VM, but since it doesn't return to, uh, like doesn't actually return, the call doesn't exit properly, so the SSH call initiated by the Go CLI will remain open, meaning that we are wasting many resources uh, on flaky CI jobs, and we don't need to do that anymore. We have a better way now. Uh, we also have 
um, an interface, an interface for running all the SSH commands uh, that we want. We can uh, uh, run commands uh, as if they are going to be executed uh, on a uh, Docker container or a virtual machine. Yeah. And from uh, the GoCLS pr perspective, it will be the same. You would just do SSH client dot command. And then you pass it whatever command that you want to pass. So highly extensible and highly usable in other uh, uh, places. Um, and will go a long way in being a base feature for other things. It also uh, facilitates unit testing for all the features that depend on this SSH functionality. So this is when it comes to what happened with regards to the SSH. Uh, what else has happened? We have... Uh, switched from using a script to provision uh, the required cluster options, for example, Istio, CNOW, anything, um, NFS CSI, to using a construct known as an opt. What is an opt? It's uh, uh, simply a struct with an exec function on it. Um, we are gonna see one very, very shortly. If we go, for example, to cnow.go, here we are. So it's just a struct that holds a Kubernetes client and an SSH client, and it will just run. It will just uh, do this exec, and it will execute the needed commands. And this is where both the benefit of the opt and the SSH uh, uh, refactor comes into play because you can see that instead of um, not being sure what your script is running because the scripts uh, previously were being deployed from the VM like the VM has the script on it and it gets called from on the VM so whatever you have in your uh, code or whatever you have in your IDE is not sure to be what's actually running because what's in the VM is what's running so here, you can just unit test it and be absolutely sure of what's uh, uh, of what's being executed, making you way, way more comfortable and um, giving you a sure way of reducing bugs and detecting problems before they appear. And also to give you like a single source of truth on what's being executed. Because like I said, um, you wouldn't be sh sure if, for example, these commands that are supposed to provision a node are what's going to be executed. The script can be modified by anything and it can even not exist on the VM for whatever there is. So this eliminates this problem and puts this logic as part of the Go CLI instead of depending on uh, uh, the providers. And the biggest benefit from this is also that you don't need to rebuild the provider because um, in order for you, for example, if you want to change one of the uh, scripts and how it uh, gets executed, you would need to put this script, to have this script be on the VM. And so you would need to rerun a provision job, uh, um, which can take from 30 minutes, uh, like between 25 and 30 minutes. So this quickly uh, uh, enhances your development workflow. Uh, you will just be able to go and change what you want to change here and recreate the Go CLI container and you're good to go. Wouldn't take you even a minute to do so. Um, another thing is uh, uh, the KV provider refactor. And this KV provider refactor is very important because it, first of all, what it is, is we have created a struct that maps to a Qubert CI cluster inside of the Go CLI. So we can go uh, see what it looks like And if we, for example, go to um, base provider and go to uh, um, the types, we can see its type definition is a struct that maps to all the, uh, uh, that has all the options that a Qubert CI cluster can have. 
uh, from the Prometheus port, DNS port, uh, uh, everything. And it's highly extensible because it has the uh, function calls that map to the cluster actions, which are provision and run and delete, obviously. So what is the main benefit that we get here? We get that adding a kubevert provider uh, or like a new provider is very, very easy now. Previously, what you had to do is you had to create another one of those directories uh, contain like with a version number, like a version in the major and minor. And you had to also include here the patch version. And this is what gets, this is how you add a new provider. And you need to copy all the scripts, which obviously you don't need to because of the ops, but you needed to copy all of the scripts into this new directory as well. Now, it is just as easy as uh, uh, just adding an entry to this map here. If you want, for example, another uh, uh, version, or if you want to change the uh, uh, minor version for uh, Kubernetes 1.31, you can just do this. And here you, ha and here you go, you have a brand new provider. So greatly reduces the size of the, uh, uh, the code base and makes changes to it very, very easy. Uh, and lastly, um, kind. Uh, as I have mentioned before, the logic to run a kind provider was all uh, uh, in the cluster up bash uh, uh, code. And let me see, let, let me, for example, show you why this can be problematic uh, or why it can be very, very complicated to navigate. Let's say that, for example, I want to make change on the um, SRIOV uh, provider. So what I'll go, what I'll do is I'll open the scripts for SRIOV and I will see, for example, that there is a provider.sh and this provider.sh calls a function to deploy SRIOV. Well, what, what is this function? I need to go and find what the function is. And it calls another script. So I need to go check that script and so on and so forth. I can very, very quickly lose track. And it, come, it can be very, very overwhelming for complicated features like SRIOV, which not everyone necessarily uh, um, has a background on it. And especially for new contributors, uh, people trying to get onboarded on the code base uh, and people trying to expand their knowledge of Kubernetes CI. This part is completely uh, um, hard to navigate and very, very obscure. So uh, one of the efforts of the rewrite is to uh, make this much more friendly. Um, we will see how this happens. Oh, sorry, make special changes. And then we go to srrv.go. For example, I can now uh, very, very quickly see what the entire logic of uh, um, SRIV execution is. And I can uh, uh, track what happens. And I can also uh, um, go to function definitions, which I don't know what they do. For example, I can see what, how creating virtual functions for a physical function works, for example, and makes it a lot more uh, friendly to deal with. And also, you when it tests, you can add uh, uh, testing to this to um, be sure 100% of what's happening and gain a much more reliable uh, uh, sort of execution to your SRIV clusters. And this is just for SRIV. Definitely the same applies to normal kind and for vGPU kind. Hmm. So uh, also it makes it uh, one solid coherent um, sort of place where you can change because previously you don't know what features are in the Go CLI, what features are in the bash code. And some features were split between the two like some things, uh, uh, parts you need to change here, parts you need to change there, and it's highly confusing. But no, this consolidates all the required logic for creating clusters and managing them into one place that you can be sure 
will work and you can do all the uh, all the things all the best practices for code uh, uh, maintenance to it uh, so the results uh, speak for themselves smaller code bases much smaller code bases and have a very very low degree of duplication um, saving many resources on flaky CI jobs and uh, um, enhance the debugging experience overall and just um, an overall more reliable code base that you can be sure is doing exactly what you want it to do that is that more deterministic than what used to exist we also got the time to explore some uh, extra uh, uh, projects and i will inform you of the status uh, uh, on each of these so we would like to use Bootsy to be able to define our VM, uh, um, how our VM would look like uh, using con container files and container images. So instead of having to, for example, read the bash script to know what gets executed on the VM, for example, if you go to this script, for example, and you need to follow along with all of this, no, not anymore. You can just, uh, uh, check uh, uh, what's in the container image. And this would be your way of uh, uh, seeing uh, what what is contained in the uh, VM. So we will see that in just a second right now. Okay, let's dot container file. Yeah. Here you go. You can just treat your VM as a container. You can treat everything that is going to be installed on the VM as you're just installing a container. And that makes it, once again, a lot more stable and a lot more. Uh, you can quickly map out what you want to do, what changes you want to do, and makes it highly, highly extensible. So uh, this is when it comes to Bootsy. And for Cube, we, for the con container control planes, we are exploring on how to um, how to run the control plane of the Hubert CI cluster on pure containers. We're going to have a container that is going to have normal Kubernetes cluster components, etcd, um, API server, scheduler, and everything else in just a container. And that will highly save resources uh, um, even further than what has been already achieved by dropping out uh, uh, one of the nodes uh, that you need to run uh, for the cluster. And it is very, very significant because we do run our CI on massive machines. And you can quickly see the costs add up per VM uh, once you do the math for how much you're actually spending. So each penny obviously matters here. And just overall, uh, the packages that have been created as well as part of this as part of this effort can be applied to uh, many areas. We've already spoken about the uh, uh, SSH package. Some of the other packages that we uh, created, we created a container runtime package, which defines a common a common interface for doing anything related to whether Docker or Podman. You can you have this uh, container client interface, and you just do whatever you want to do with a container engine, uh, create pull whatever, and it's a unified experience between Docker and Podman, and we can also extend it to Nerd CTL or any other container runtime engine that you want to uh, um, include. Previously, it was just Docker. There was no concept of Podman in the uh, Go CLI. And as well as the uh, Kubernetes uh, um, Kubernetes package, which is we have defined a Kubernetes client um, that you can use in the cluster. All you need to do is just add something to the schema. And just, like, just as we're doing here, and then you're ready to go. You can do uh, a normal uh, CTL operations. You just serialize your manifest and you're good to go. You can get apply, delete, treat it as you're working with kubectl. 
um so yeah so this is it um i hope that you guys uh, um found this useful and i would be happy if you have any questions Thank yeah. you for this work. I have one. I have one quick question. Uh, so, can you give me any examples of some of the speed ups that you've accomplished? I mean, you mentioned a few, but any overall uh, takeaways? Okay, so um, the first one is uh, in the uh, provisioning flakes resulting from uh, the caller timing out or waiting for a response. from the SSH connection. This can overall result in up to uh, like a full CI job of three hours length, completely wasted. And you would need to wait until the VM exits forcefully uh, by the CI job killing it itself. So this is an area where we have saved time, for example. Another area uh, is while trying to change a script to include it in a kubevert provider. This process used to take like 25, 30 minutes of development time uh, because you need to rebuild uh, the uh, uh, provider locally while you're testing. But now it just takes a minute or two, maybe even less, 30 seconds, because the, the Go CLI is very, very, has a very, very small container, so you can just build it in 30 seconds. Well, once you do make container, so um, this this is like the obvious ones. This is the obvious time discount. Uh, but the indirect ones are obviously the development uh, time saved and the time saved in detecting bugs by previously all of what I said was didn't have any tests other than the uh, uh, Qbert lane itself, the Qbert uh, CI uh, testing lane. to test it and it can miss a few things leading to wasted resources um first of all developer developer time ci resources uh debugging time now you have shifted the failure or like you, should, you quickly reduce the time required to detect a failure because you have unit tests for everything so this is the unobvious or like the not very obvious uh, uh time save uh that has been achieved by this i hope this answers your question yeah 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 just i i wondered if you had any before and after uh metrics or or measurements oh uh, uh, no unfortunately not. i'm sorry i would definitely recommend you do that as another summary um there's just a just a request but i think that would also really add a good feel good um punch to to this slide so thank you so much And lots of people asking questions in the chat. I'll, I'll stand down. Okay, so let me see if there was, uh... Oh, let me just yeah, do you uh, have rephrase a, the question. Yeah, do you have a design document? Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I was just wanting to uh, um, voice the question from Igor, um, who is asking for a design document. I'm not sure if you have one. Uh, no, uh, but I think one would be highly helpful. I can create one and share it with the team. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, and yeah, so um, any other questions to Amar? Yeah, got another question. So yeah, first, thanks for the, for the great work. Looks awesome. Um, I wanted to ask, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask about the, the odds. So to me, it looked like... Mm -hmm. Previously, we copied the, the options for each provider over and over. Now we're mm -hmm. using the same options for, for each of the providers, the same options. Mm. Mm. Um, is it still possible to use like customized or individual options per provider? Like, for example, in a Kubernetes 1. Point, whatever, 3.2, there's a new uh, this... feature which is only available in this version. Yes, yes. Uh, well, this has been maintained for the options that had this built into them. Like for example, we have CDI, AIQ, and uh, uh, CNOW. All of these 
uh, they, you could pass a custom version and the custom version would apply a different version than what you would apply to all the providers. And it gets passed via a flag. So if you want, for example, if you have like a Kubernetes 1.32 and you want for it an option, um, like CDI, a particular version that supports this uh, new Kubernetes version, you could do so via uh, a flag in the Go CLI uh, instead of having to modify the manifest itself. Um, so this is the way that you would do it now. But from the point of view of the caller, it's the same because from the point of view of the caller, it's to just make cluster up. This is what what the main entry point for all of this was. And you would configure make cluster up using environment variables uh, that you would pass uh, from the shell. So all what's happening is that uh, these environment variables are now being taken. And instead of deploying a script, they are being used to change the op itself inside of the uh, uh, Go CLI. I hope this answers your question as well. Yeah, I see. But uh, I was just thinking, um, did we have, like, or can you disable options for, for some of the versions? Like, they're using all of the, the options right now, right? Each, Um, each uh, version is using the same set of options. uh, well, the options are there, but you are who you, the caller is who decides what do you want to deploy on each cluster. You don't necessarily need to deploy a cluster containing everything. You can deploy only what you need. And this is how it used to happen previously as well. Um, you would select which things that you want to run on the cluster. And so it's the same. You can still choose whatever you want to run on the cluster. But rather than run a bash script, it will run an opt. And it's a single single entity that you manage for all your options uh, for all your providers at once without having to edit four scripts to entice a change, for example. Maybe to add to the answer, maybe to add to the answer, it's that now it's go. So you just miss missing one if statement, and that's it. Hey, uh, I have another question. It looks like great work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, about the so-called onboarding, for example, because. From terms of being backward compatible, I'm like I'm used for the old way, right? And now the mm. complete it's like a complete refactoring. And uh, uh, do you have some hints mm. or, or does the refactoring is like looks like safe explainable? Because now, for example, I, I need to add something for uh, for QGIS CI, so for the newest providers to use. Uh, for example, system DC group driver for kubelet config. So I remember in the past that, you know, yeah, I had to change it in the, I think it was kubeadm conf, it was kind of a template. And I remember that I just did the patch for that uh, PR. Now what I need to do in order to to add that ability for kubelet configuration, for example. Mm, well, that's a great question. And I have uh, multiple answers to this. First of all, um, not all of this code is fully merged. Like the parts that uh, will highly affect specific stakeholders uh, uh, in the Kubevert org, SIG network, for example, SIG storage, is still being uh, reviewed with them. And so the change has not been fully implemented yet. That's uh, uh, number one. Number two, as a user, it should be the same. It should be the exact same uh, uh, experience where, for whatever parameters you pass and for whatever uh, uh, configuration that you pass to the cluster, it is the same. And the only thing so far that has changed and um, is not the normal way of doing things or isn't, um, is if you want to add a new option. If you want to, for example, deploy, I don't know, Nginx on the cluster. Previously, what you would do is you would create an Nginx script in all uh, provider directories and add like a function to call this Nginx uh, 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 script inside of the, uh, of, of the bash code required. Uh, but now what you do is you just uh, uh, create an opt that will deploy Nginx for you and it can apply to all the providers at once. 
So this is the only real change so far. Other than this, it's all the same. And the things that are highly breaking are still being negotiated with the respective stakeholders. Ah, I got you. Uh, thank you. Another question. I remember that we had this logic that we drop a provision SH file on the virtual machine. We are provisioning and that provision SH file basically configures the virtual machine, the provider, the VM-based provider before it's paused. So this logic remains the same or you changed it somehow? Uh, no. The exact execution of whatever happens in anything, whether provision.sh, ksprovision.sh, any of the scripts, it's being executed exactly the same. The only difference is uh, uh, it's just being executed from a different color or other than the script. Mm -hmm. It's the Go CLI itself. But yes, everything is still the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. And yeah, definitely, uh, uh, I do appreciate your suggestion about the uh, design document. It would come to play, or it would be definitely of higher importance once more and more of this code gets merged uh, uh, on the repo. Yeah, thank you. I was also asked, uh, thinking about some kind of refactoring in that area and for these configurations and scripts to be more declarative rather than imperative, integrating something like Ansible. So everything you mm. figure as part of provision could be declarative and more meaningful instead of, you know, imperative procedural uh, code or script that does stuff. Um, mm. Yeah, well, I think maybe you consider that already as you had pros and cons. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it can be a good follow-up, but definitely we can explore it if... Uh, um, if we see the uh, value added from it, but definitely we'll need some uh, investment in planning it. But yeah, definitely a great suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any other questions from anyone else? So I think this silence I, we can interpret as uh, no more questions. Amar, yes. thank you very much for your great presentation. Happy to have you in the community. And um, I was just wanting to ask you one question. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a good question, but I was thinking about like, what was the one thing that gave you a hard time working on the project? Um while implementing my changes or while navigating the previous state of uh, uh, Gilbert CI? Um, you decide, I think. Um, okay, well, I can answer both because definitely both uh, um, will have um, an interesting answer to them. And it's a great question, by the way. So when it comes to navigating the current state of Gilbert CI, uh, the problem which I have highlighted with the SRI or VUE, right? is arguably the biggest problem um, I've had because uh, it's very, very hard to track the execution logic. It's hard to see what passes the variables to what. And it's also hard to keep track of, okay, so we're now relying on some logic in the Go CLI and now we're, we're, we're back to bash. For example, this was in Istio. Part of the Istio logic is in the Go CLI and the other part is in the uh, uh, bash code. This was uh, um, difficult to deal with uh, and difficult to navigate. And I think the uh, difficulty of implementing my own work was not in the work itself, but rather uh, definitely in uh, getting consensus from the Kubrick community, because obviously, um, it's very big, and um, it was truly a, a humbling experience to see that sh to change such critical code and such uh, uh, highly, highly important uh, piece of logic requires uh, uh, alignment with many, many stakeholders, and you need to um, have them all be on the same page while you're working. So this was definitely a challenge. Um, it was very fulfilling, but nevertheless still a challenge 
Um, but yeah, I was very, very happy in tackling it. And um, I do think, still think that there is uh, more of this to come as we try to merge the rest of the code. Uh, but yes, this I think was overall uh, uh, one of the more um, you know challenging aspects of it. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are no more other questions, then I would probably like uh, go to switch over to the normal agenda. And again, thanks for your presentation and for your hard work, Amar. Thank you um, very much for your support. And back to you, Daniel. I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. OK, so um, the next thing, I'm going to reshare my window again. Uh, wait a second. Um, da, da, da. Share. Let me try to find the window again. Share. OK, I hope that this works OK now. Let me see. Screen sharing looks pretty much OK. Um, OK. Um, so first of all, I would want to pick up the discussion about the Qubit community inactivity uh, that we triggered off uh, last week somehow, or I, I figure um, it was the end of last week where I wrote a mail about uh, asking about the status of that one. So is there a way that anyone can think that we want to proceed with this? Um, I thought I understood the mails that they were going quite into different directions, and I would want to probably hear from the community um, whether there is might be might be ideas or maybe on the maintainers that there might be um, ideas on how we want to tackle this. Um, what can we do? Daniel, uh, are we speaking about uh, the uh, the uh, community repo? Um, yes, I, exactly. I, wasn't, I wasn't here last week. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I should have probably given more context about that. So, um, I I personally was having a bit of a hard time uh, getting the community PRs in from my point of view, and I was when I was looking, I was noticing that there is like quite a couple of community PRs that are actually missing attention. And so um, I was wondering uh, what we could do about that. So um, I think from, from what I see from the meeting notes from last week, what I noticed what, uh, was that like we had 20, at that time we had 28 community PRs open of which like uh, a couple of those had LGTMs, but many were somehow missing um, like reviews um, and yeah, I just wanted to bring that up to your attention that we might need to have have some work to do on that one. So the community uh, repo also contains the uh, uh, the design documents. Is, is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, naturally, these uh, can take a long time uh, to converge. But the thing is that uh, the um, the design documents can be. I wonder if, if they could be separated from the rest of the, uh, you know, community governance. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, naturally I would expect the, um, the design documents to take time uh, from various different reasons. Uh, I see caps and in, uh, in Kubernetes also take uh, extensive amount of time. Mm. Um, I can suggest to divide the GAMU community to SIGs as well, like SIG ARC and SIG governance, and then maybe we can be like SIG ARC approvals and then design document. The design proposal can be reviewed by a subset of SIG ARC approvals or something like that. Yeah, that, that could work. Yeah.
Yeah, okay. So, um, and I also thought, I faintly remember that there was a, uh, like, like a separation of the design documents into a separate repository. And that might also help, like when we take it out of the community repository, but I don't, don't remember where that went, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'll, I'll need to check. But I think, uh, yeah. I mean, for me, the main uh, the main point is the design documents. They uh, they are on a different time scale than the rest of the uh, the rest of the PRs in this repo. Okay. Okay, then I'll do that. Uh, Sorry. Medic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted to to ask if um, I think there there was in there was a specific thread in the e emails about this uh, with kind of suggestion that mainly focused on adding more approvals. So I wonder, do you think it's reasonable that the existing approvals there will will just agree on something and then then come to with some options outside, like for example, what you just said about splitting out the the proposals either to a different repo or even in the same repository, but with a different owner file, uh, stuff like that. Could this be resolved like internally? Because there is a, it feels uncomfortable that we need to talk about what needs to be done there. Uh, as a community and not as uh, the only the approvers it feels like the approver should should get together and agree what's the best step forward because i i mean there was uh, some some uh, some direction that said that approvers in the cover covid project should be also the approvers in the cover community which is like a, an option i guess but that was not the original intention of what it means to be an approver in the COVID community. So all of these discussions, maybe can can they be done like uh, first internally and then open up for uh, for the public? We can, we can. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm less uh, fond for all of this uh, secrecy, really, but... Uh... You, you know my uh, my take on this. Uh, for a long time, I uh, um, I would say I wasn't very attached to um, to these design documents. I felt uh, this is more of a you know su suggestion uh, to me. Uh, this this hard requirement for like a specific design documents was never a thing. Uh, I wanted some kind of a loose process, and uh, I think most of us uh, were in that uh, state of mind. Now things changed, um, and uh, we do require more formal process. So if this is a formal process, and we are kind of going after uh, the Kubernetes model and OpenStack model, where you know uh, these things are are very they take a long time and a long a lot of discussions then. And yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we need to decide what like what to do with these, but we, we can bring it we can bring it up on Monday and then and then see what's what's next. Okay, thanks. Okay then. Um then let's switch to the open floor. Um I have an announcement to make. Vladek um, suggested that we take a look at the Dosu bot. Um, so for people who are not familiar with that bot, it uh, helps other repositories in um, automatically adding content to issues and labeling them. Um, I mean, it does not only that, but you have like uh, like a couple of other things that it does. For now, we are just evaluating it. Um, and you might see some um, messages or comments on issues uh, done by a certain Dosu app. Uh, so that is actually what we are talking about right now. Um, we have got a couple of responses already. And um, so what I'm asking um, is that uh, we have been offered by the authors uh, a session to show us around at what Dosubot can do. 
Um, so I would request that anyone is, who is interested to take part, please add your email uh, into the uh, open floor uh, point that I already um, uh, added. So I see two people already have signed up. Um, I uh, would um, then um, at uh, I think today or tomorrow I would then request a uh, request a, an appointment for that, and then um, I think we can we can um, all uh, be taken around and see what is what what is going on there and what, what how we can use it uh, so that it helps us. So from what I saw, at least um, the comments that the bot itself does did did help to. Um, yeah, to iron out a lot of things uh, in other repositories. So maybe um, uh, it would be a good thing to, to take a look at this. So uh, my thoughts on that. Um, so if I may reflect that uh, quickly, um, first of all, I would probably um, think about uh, integrating the dashboard once we have configured that correctly into the issue review or bug scrub. Um, since uh, yeah, since the bot is also already commenting on the issues, we might we might uh, take a look at the, the uh, comments that it did. And uh, second of all, I think that we all as a community need to steer um, so the bot can learn um, whether the applied comments are useful or not. And I think uh, from my understanding, um, this is done by adding thumbs up and thumbs down. So please go ahead. If you think that a message by Dosu is um, helpful, then please add a thumbs up. And if you don't agree with what it says, then please add a thumbs down. This will, um, uh, I understand like that this will feed the bot um, and uh, in helping it understand what, um, what the things are about. Um, Okay, so any questions to that? Oh yeah, one, one uh, second. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry. I was just wanting to add, like Mark um, and Larry, um, I've added you. Uh, I've added you um, as a uh, as the um, uh, Dosu admin. So you can take over and take a look at the board. You just need to accept the invitation, I think. Um, so sorry, I think. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I think, uh, Felix, I heard you, right? Yeah, right. Uh, I wanted to ask about labels. So can you teach it also um, if, if the use of labels was appropriate or not? Because um, I created a PR, which uh, is removing some some duplicate code, and the those support labels the issue or the, the PR as a duplicate. So. Ah, interesting. OK. Um... Um, so it, uh, what from what I understood, it can be configured to apply labels to uh, issues and PRs. Um, we might still uh, need to update the configuration that it also looks at the labels that you want. If you see anything, then please ping uh, me or Vladik, for example, um, on the issue which you think uh, that the label might not be applied correctly so that we can take another look at the configuration. Maybe that might be something that we didn't do correctly somehow. Yeah, I, I also followed up. Like I, I saw um, some issues today that were uh, answered and it definitely had uh, a few misses. Uh, for example, it confused the um it, it confused like a PCI bridges with the like a, with network bridges and things like this but I, I I'm not sure if it's able to learn <laughs> but uh, yeah when you we need to see it, it's definitely helpful in other communities uh, I'm not sure how did they adjust but we can give it a try and the, even in CNCF communities uh, so it's up to us I guess. Yeah, I think I agree. And like, so my my impression was that uh, what I saw was that it was adding like a thumbs up and another thumbs down as emojis to the to the um, command itself created. So I think that this might indicate that we uh, need to use those to steer it. But yeah, I might be wrong. And I think let's then 
let's just maybe we can also probably like uh, create a repository of questions that we have uh, for the session that we are offered. So uh, that might be one thing that we might want to ask on that one, I think. Okay, um, so I have another thing for the open floor. Sorry for that I'm talking so long for, for um, already. Um, I was just uh, discovering recently a PR um, where uh, the owner struggled with applying labels. So um, I have um, 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 added some uh, document to the uh, to the Cuba community meetings uh, where which which points to the labels markdown. Um, I'm also adding it, this to the chat. Um, this gives you an overview over what labels are currently present and which can be used um, on the on issues and pull requests. And it also tells you what those labels are for, mostly, hopefully, if you uh, like want to improve like uh, the documentation of those labels, you are highly welcome. Um, but you need to take into account if you want to use those labels, they first of all, they need to exist. And second, there is a special way where you can apply them. So the Prowl label plugin executes some commands like, for example, slash, slash area, um, a space monitoring, um, and then it would apply the area slash monitoring label, which is the same like for kind bug and sick compute. Just so that a quick reminder of how we are, uh, of how you can apply those labels. Um, and that's it for this. A um, lot of good question. I think we don't. Um, so also the labels markdown gives a bit of advice on how you uh, would go um, in adding those labels. So um, I could probably then um, create a pull request uh, to, um, to add the area test label. Or let me take a quick look. Let me see, uh, copy link. Um, so this is the, um, this is the, um, the page I'm talking about. So I am looking for, for example, like area tests, which we don't have, but we have a couple of others like API server controller, et cetera. Um, area test is missing. So um, you would uh, normally go ahead and um, there should be in the top of the document. Yeah, actually it's like this one. This uh, tells you uh, where the definition of the labels YAML, which actually um, configures the labels that we have, uh, where this lives. Um, and there you can uh, add a pull request against um, and add your labels or change the documentation of the labels, for example. Okay, so... Um, Um, that's a good question. Um, so area, I would say, is a general kind of like a classification. Um, maybe someone else who knows better than me can give a, uh, a an overview. What I, what I see, for example, is like those labels are only applicable to Cupid Cupid issues and PRs. So um, I might be the wrong person to ask. But yeah, what I recently saw. Uh, for example, like uh, area monitoring was um, is something like that that you would probably apply to to things that concern monitoring. I don't know actually, uh, Eddie, if if that's like uh, like sub project labels. Um, I think we we are still still trying to settle down when it comes to like six sub projects and working groups. So um, yeah, I think there might be some consolidation that is required. I see that we're already over time. Um, so I'm sorry for taking more time than you uh, initially signed up for. Um, any last uh, mentions, any last um, comments that you want to do? I'm really sorry that we need to skip pull requests uh, that need attention today.
So may I ask for everyone who is concerned with uh, looking at pull requests, we have the section of pull requests that need attention. There is a couple of, uh, of entries there. Uh, please uh, take a look at these and help um, bring them forward. Um, other than that, I would thank you all for your attendance and for your valuable feedback. Um, and with that, I would want to close the community meeting and wish you a great week and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.